So welcome everybody, um, ladies and gentlemen, fellow members. Um, it's very nice to see people here in the Senate House, um, as well as to be able to welcome people um, around the world who are tuning in virtually. Um, I'm not Fiona Hara, although it says so on the screen. Um, I'm Tim Cornell, the president of the Roman Society, and as I say, I'm very pleased to welcome you all. Um, now, <clears throat> today we are able to put on our often postponed um, colloquium on the city of Rome. Um, delighted to have uh, three of our speakers here, uh, but unfortunately I have to say that John Patterson uh, is not well, um, and we wish him a very speedy recovery, but unfortunately he's not able to be with us today. So we have just the three speakers, um, Claire Holler and uh, Ian Haynes and Janet Delane, um, and uh, they will each speak for um, up to half an hour. Um, there will be time then for questions, and if people want to ask questions um, uh, online, um, please use the chat uh, function and uh, we'll see what we can do um, to get some um, questions from there and otherwise we'll take questions in the room. But let me first introduce uh, our first speaker, um, Claire Holleran, who's a senior lecturer at Exeter University. Um, she's very well known for um, her work on the city of Rome in general. She's one of the co-editors of the Blackwell Companion to the City of Rome. Uh, and she, uh, her first book, which was her thesis that she did at the University of Manchester, I'm proud to say, uh, is called Shopping in Ancient Rome and is a really fascinating study of um, the way in which goods and services reached the population of the city of Rome um, in uh, ancient conditions and uh, as, as a fascinating study of um, the distribution of goods and services. Um, she's uh, gone on from that to do other, uh, study other aspects of uh, city life, um, the uh, sort of street life in the city of Rome, and is currently working on a book uh, on working in Rome, which is her title today. So she's going to tell us something about how the population of the city of Rome earned their living. Claire. Thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction and um, thank you for the invitation. It's nice to be here finally and in person. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is working in Rome, which is something that I've been looking at off and on for quite some time now. And I sometimes think that I owe my entire um, career, such as it is, to a, a sort of idle moment in a third year undergraduate course on Roman society and economy in, um, in Manchester with Graham Burton when I asked the question, you know, what did people in Rome do? Um, what did they do for work? And he directed me to Peter Brunt's work on the, the Roman mob and free labor and public works. So I kind of came to it from there, but it's something that I've been working on, on and off really ever since, even as my research goes in different directions. So I'm also working at the moment on um, migration, which has sort of brought me back around to thinking about economic migration and particularly the migration of skilled workers. And that's what I want to think about today in the context of Rome. I should say that, th that this is um, an entirely frivolous and speculative paper. Um, I can't prove anything that I'm going to say today. There's lots of perhapses and maybes and possiblies, um, but I think it's useful to, to sort of think about the experience of the skilled economic migrant in Rome. So that's what I'm gonna try and do. Um, taking as the starting point, this inscription here. So this is an inscription um, dating to probably the first century CE. Um, it was found in the 1920s um, near to Porta Maggiore during construction work. And it's the tombstone of one Maximus um, who died in Rome aged 22. And he has this um, small marble stele with this Greek verse on it, um, quite small. It's about 30 centimetres wide, 45 centimetres high. And it says, um, to the gods of the underworld, this tomb holds Maximus, um, son of Dionysus and of um, Copernia, um, possibly I don't know, maybe a, a Greek version of Calpurnia there, his mother, 
um, 22 years old, house builder and carpenter. So whether this is a, a Greek version of a, a Faber Tinuarius, um, faultless in his craft from the Astakian homeland, died here, leaving wretched grief for his parents. So I kind of want to take this as a starting point, really, for thinking about the potential experience of Maximus as um, an economic migrant. I think this inscription in particular is, is quite interesting because his parents are named here. So that raises the possibility of um, family migration. You know, did he come as a family group? If he did, at what age? Um, so did he come already trained up as a house builder, as a carpenter? So perhaps as a young adult already trained with or without his parents. It doesn't actually say that they put this up, um, but clearly they are still living. Um, or did he come with his parents as a child and had an apprenticeship in Rome? I mean, we don't know the answers to any of these questions. And of course, they do have implications for our understanding of Maximus. Um, in a sense, what I want to do today really is use this inscription as a starting point to think about the experiences of that skilled economic migrant coming to Rome. So I'm going to work here from the scenario that he, he did come as a young adult, as a skilled young adult. Um, so I'm really using him as a, a sort of type, if you will. So he's, he's a real character, but um, I'm going to make a sort of fiction around him and his possible experience. So think about how would a skilled economic migrant like Maximus integrate himself into Rome? How might he find somewhere to live? How might he find work? Um, yeah. And how could he demonstrate his skill and his suitability for work? Um, I think what we can say straight off about Maximus is that he must have been relatively successful. Um, he's clearly skilled and he can afford this marble stele, albeit a small one. Um, so we are potentially here looking at a sort of migrant success story. So I want to start by thinking about where he was from. So he talks about this Astakian homeland here. Um, now there are two places he could be from. Um, one is Astakos in Greece, in Akinania. Um, so this is just a Trismegistos um, entry for that one. Or it could be Astakos in Bithynia. Now in the few mentions in secondary um, scholarship that I found to this inscription, in the few times it's discussed, Maximus is always described as being from Bithynia. So this is the one that's usually preferred. And actually a noise book on foreigners in Rome, he describes uh, Maximus as being specifically from Nicomedia, um, which is actually not unreasonable because actually Astakos is very, very close to Nicomedia. I mean, if you look here, it's just across the water, that's what, six kilometers. So really it could be seen as a, a kind of suburb of um, Nicomedia. Now, as far as I can see, there's no specific arguments made for preferring Bithynia to Greece here, um, whether it's just that link to Nicomedians, that larger centre that makes people prefer this as a starting point for Maximus. Um, and what we do know from other evidence is that Nicomedia was a centre of um, marble trade. It was a centre of marble sculptors um, and they are being so marble is being exported, marble sculptors are being kind of moved around from there to certainly the Eastern Mediterranean, um, perhaps also to Rome. So we might think of Maximus sort of piggybacking on that trade, on that mobility um, of materials and products and people that is coming out of Nicomedia there. So I'm going to follow um, what people have done and take Nicomedia as a starting point, but bear in mind that that is ambiguous, that we don't know again for sure that that's what's happening here. Now, thinking about his journey, it, it's very hard when you just have a grave marker to know if we're looking at migration. And by migration, I mean a sort of longer term one off movement or at least an intermittent movement. Um, so it's difficult to know if we're looking at that or uh, mobility more generally. So more itinerancy. You know, was he moving around and he just happened to be at Rome when he died? And he's only 22 when he dies. Um, so we don't know, you know, we can't say what Maximus was really doing. And that does, of course, have implications for his journey. So was he going from Nicomedia to Rome? Or was he sort of moving around from place to place, um, perhaps on commissions, or perhaps as a sort of jobbing builder who's going around and eventually finding his way to Rome? 
course, we don't know. Um, but what we can do is just think a little bit about his journey. We can put him into um, Orbis. Um, so going from Nicomedia to Rome in spring by the fastest route would take him almost 20 days. Um, the cheapest journey is fairly similar. The shortest one takes a couple of months. It goes over land. Um, so if he's doing it in one journey, um, presumably he's going by sea. Of course, there's no passenger ships in the ancient world. So we could envisage Maximus going down to the waterfront, asking around, organizing his passage on some kind of trading ship um, on an individual basis with the shipper. Um, taking his own supplies for the journey and kind of replenishing them as they stop at each port. Now, he didn't necessarily start at Nicomedia and say, I want passage to Rome. He may have done this in stages. So maybe go to Ephesus, cross to Corinth, um, around to Rome, or maybe go this way, go up the hill and overland through southern Italy. Um, whatever he did choose as a journey, he obviously um, survives. I mean, obviously shipwreck is, is a huge issue here, possibly piracy, although maybe not so much in the first century. Um, but he gets to Rome, so he needs now to find a place to live and he needs to find work. So let's say he's got enough money left to I don't know, hole up in a tavern somewhere for a couple of nights. What's he going to do next? Um, and we might suppose the first thing that he would do would be to look to make some kind of connections. Um, now, whether he just tried to make them in his neighborhood that he was staying in, um, you know, asking around for a bed in an insula or a room in an insula and some work, possibly. Um, but we might think that for someone like Maximus, um, he would look to find connections with other people from Nicomedia or at least from Bithynia. So studies of contemporary migration suggest that the, the sort of monopolization of particular trades and the residential clustering in neighborhoods by certain ethnic or migrant groups can help new migrants to establish themselves within communities and to find housing and to find work. But actually when we look at Rome, there isn't a huge amount of evidence for that kind of residential clustering or for the domination of any particular trade by any particular ethnic group. Um, so we have that suggestion of a Jewish community in Trastevere, um, but not so much beyond that. Um, so there is a couple of sources from the, the late Republic that might suggest some kind of um, group solidarity, if you will, amongst migrant groups. Um, so Suetonius tells us that at the death of Caesar, um, a throng of foreigners are going about lamenting each after the fashion of his country. So, so people mourning in their ancestral fashion perhaps suggesting that we do have these groups of people joining together from particular areas. And also Cicero in Pro Flacco there talks about um, groups of Phrygians disrupting these contiones in the late Republic. So again, maybe some kind of um, group solidarity. I mean, this is the late Republic, Maximus is a bit later, um, but perhaps there are groups of Bithynians or Nicomedians that he can kind of go to, um, to, to find his way into the city. The other more formal way of doing that might be through um, the stationes. So that's another possibility. So these are um, kind of offices that probably housed um, representatives of particular towns who were who had people living in Rome, trading in Rome, um, working in Rome. In the first century, we know from a couple of sources that these are based around the Forum, so right in the centre of Rome. So um, Suetonius tells us that Salvidianus Orphitus was charged with having let to certain states as headquarters, as Staciones, three, um, three shops, three taberni, which form part of his house near the Forum. And Pliny also in the first century tells us, he's talking about a nettle tree here, a lotos, um, that its roots spread right across the municipal offices the Stationus Municipiorum, as far as the Forum of Caesar. So they do seem to be somewhere within the centre here. Um, and we also have from um, that area fragments of inscriptions which look to belong to Stationes. Um, so this is an image here of um, an architrave fragment from what was probably the Statio of Tarsus. Um, this is a 1953 image um, from the Via Sacra. So perhaps he went to that kind of place. I mean, as far as I know, there's no evidence of one from Nicomedia, 
um, or actually from anywhere in Bithynia, but that doesn't mean they didn't exist. So maybe that was Maximus's first port of call when he's looking to make connections. I mean, he's a skilled worker. So in terms of finding work, perhaps Astatio might help him. Um, I mean, I suspect some of the other ways of finding work in Rome, things like congregating. Um, so, you know, we, we do hear about people congregating, waiting to be hired. I mean, most famously, you see that in the New Testament with that parable of the vineyard workers. Um, it's unlikely, I think, as a skilled worker, that that's the kind of way that someone like Maximus would be finding work. Um, that's primarily for kind of unskilled casual laborers. It might be where he went to find workers himself, um, but probably not where he would find work. Perhaps he went to the Aventine district and asked around in the, the kind of lumber yards and timber merchants that were located in that region. Certainly they were earlier anyway. So Livy tells us that in 192 BC, um, the Edals built a porticus outside the Porta Trigamina among the woodworkers, so inter Lignarius in this kind of region down here. And in the second century, um, we know of a Vicus Materiarius, Street of the Timber Merchants. Um, so maybe he can go to those kind of places, try to find connections that way. I mean, certainly for skilled work, research has shown that networks and associations are very important in finding work. That's um, kind of long been the subject of research in the social sciences, most famously um, Granovetta with his work looking at the difference between weak ties and strong ties. Um, and what his work showed was that individuals who have ties to multiple groups are at a particular advantage when it comes to finding information about potential employment opportunities. So if we think about someone like Maximus, you know, he might try to make connections in a number of ways. So things like his neighborhood, um, the Stationes, um, going to these timber merchants and so on. But I also think one of the one of the biggest unknowns, I guess, but also one of the biggest possibilities here um, are collegia, and in particular for Maximus, probably the Collegium Fabrum Tenariorum, which is this huge collegia, uh, sorry, collegium in Rome. And we know in the in the later second, early third century, um, we have an inscription that says this was divided into sixty decurii each with about 22 members. So we know then there was at least 1300 members. Um, so perhaps in the first century when Maximus is, is, is in Rome, it's also pretty large. Now, if we're honest, um, there's, there's a lot we don't know about Calagia. I mean, we're reliant primarily on inscriptions. So we know quite a lot about the sort of face that they want to present to the world, but less about what they actually do. Um, I mean, there's a there's a big debate about the extent to which those collegia should be viewed as economic rather than social institutions, but they almost certainly had some economic benefits for their members. Um, I mean, for the collegium of the Fabri Tenari in particular, we know at one time one of their patrons was the curator of public works, so that perhaps gave members preferential treatment when it came to contracts for public work. Another of the potential benefits of occupational collegia was access to information, so important professional information. So members could share knowledge about techniques, um, about markets, about the supply of raw materials, um, and perhaps also about potential workers. So I've argued um, elsewhere that the information networks of a collegia may have gone some way towards simplifying the process of finding good skilled workers which is particularly difficult. Um, so they may have enabled an employer to find reputable workers quickly and efficiently. And in doing that, that lowers the transaction costs associated with recruiting good skilled labor. So if Maximus could make connections with the Collegium, I mean, not necessarily become a member, although maybe he did, but if he could make these connections, that is potentially um, a very profitable way of getting into networks of skilled workers within the construction industry in Rome. And it's possible that they had some sort of permanent headquarters in the center of Rome. Um, so there's a number of inscriptions found kind of in the area of Santa Mabono um, at the foot of the Capitoline Hill, which might indicate that that's where they had their headquarters. So not far from those um, stationers. So maybe he could go and try to get a connection that way. I mean, the other way of looking at that, I suppose, is Calagia as 
as gatekeepers, um, that if Maximus is excluded from those ready-made networks, then he might struggle. Um, I mean, he doesn't have to be a member to work in construction in Rome, but being an outsider may have made it difficult to progress very far. Um, also, if he's not a member, or at least not approved, I mean, did it make people reluctant to employ him? Was um, a link to this kind of palladium a, a kind of implicit guarantor of your skill level? Is it an indicator of your good standing and your skills? Um, which leads me then on to the, the sort of final question, how does Maximus show his skill? Even if he's able to make these connections, how does he demonstrate his skill? How do they know that he is who he says he is? How do they know he's a skilled woodworker? Because there's no professional qualification as such. Um, there's none of those kind of signaling devices that we would have in a, in a modern labor market. I mean, presumably he'd done an apprenticeship, but if he'd done that in Nicomedia, um, people in Rome wouldn't know much about that. And we know that apprenticeships vary considerably in terms of their length and the skill level that people attained. Um, I mean, if it's in Nicomedia, people might know who taught him. They might know it was Apollodorus and oh, Apollodorus is good. So you know that he's a good worker. But if he's coming to Rome, people wouldn't know. So how does he prove that? And I think that the, the kind of legal concept of imperitia or lack of skill does suggest that there is some kind of externally measurable notion of skill, that there is an appropriate proficiency level for skilled workers. Um, so that concept of imperitia, it governs the liability against damage to property that's caused by you know, incompetent or poorly skilled workers. So the, the big example in the digest is if an artisan breaks a precious stone that he's been given to set or engrave, um, if it's due to a lack of skill or experience, so if it's due to imperitia, then he is liable for the value of the precious stone. And that isn't directly relevant to the building trade, but what it does imply is that if you enter into a contract um, as a skilled worker, you are implicitly claiming that you have the necessary skills to complete that job. Um, and where that becomes relevant in construction is with this process of probatio, so that process by which work is formally inspected at the end of a contract of building work. And that ought to reflect um, the judgment of a good man. Um, so arbitrary and bonnie weary. So Maximus presumably would have to reach that level. So how does he show that to people in Rome? And presumably then as now, reputation and recommendations must have played a key role in assessing the competency of skilled workers. Now, Maximus, as a, as a migrant, presumably had no local reputation um, until somebody gave him a chance to demonstrate his skill. So maybe he just had to take time to establish that reputation. So he had to go through that process of probatio a few times, get a reputation locally. Or perhaps he bypassed that stage by coming armed with some kind of letter of recommendation or letters of recommendation. I mean, we do have quite a lot of evidence um, for letters of personal recommendation. Perhaps the surviving examples there point to a wider phenomenon that, um, especially among migrants um, and in larger urban centers like Rome where relative strangers are being employed. Um, I mean, that system does rely on a certain level of literacy, at least on the part of employers. But I think with uh, Maximus looking at his funerary monument, we can probably assume that he is also literate. That letter of recommendation is a sort of well-known phenomenon um, from the Roman world. It relates very often to hospitality, um, to marriage, to loans or friendship, but it does on occasion uh, relate to employment. Now, most of our examples are at the level of government posts, but we do have some examples from other employment. Um, so there are some examples in the papyrological material. Most of them occur, or that there's a sort of cluster of them, in the Zedon archive, which is outside of our period. So this is third century BCE. Um, but we do have a number of examples within that of people being recommended for particular employment roles. So that first one there is Ptolemaeus to Zenon. Um, this is about somebody who's sailed down to obtain employment in the office of Philiscus, and he's being recommended um, by some accountants. And the next one is a, a kind of more general one, Artemidorus to Zenon. Mm. Look, this person, he's my friend. He'll be useful to you in some way. So this is a kind of letter of introduction. 
Um, and the last one there is from a soldier. This is later, this is second century CE. This is a serving soldier um, who wrote a letter to his father, a veteran, mentioning among other things that you know, he really would like to be transferred from the Alexandrian fleet to a military cohort. As if God should be willing, I hope to live frugally and be transferred to a cohort. But here, nothing will be accomplished without money. And letters of recommendation have no value unless a man helps himself. I mean, what Terentianus, who's wrote, who wrote this letter, is implying here is that letters of recommendation and personal patronage could be useful for promotion in the army. But actually, the implication is, I guess, that a bribe is better um, in this instance. Whatever he did, it worked because we have a later letter that said he did get transferred. So whatever he did worked. Now it's a, it's a bit of a stretch, but did Maximus carry something similar? Did he have a letter of recommendation from somebody in Nicomedia to take to Rome to introduce himself, to get him into some kind of networks? I suppose the question then arises, well, the people in Rome have to know the person who's written the letter for it to really mean much. Um, so you know, how, how useful is it if you don't know who the person who's written the letter? I don't know, but it's a, it's a possibility at least that maybe he has some kind of introduction or letter of recommendation. So um, I kind of end by coming back to that inscription there. This is something of a, a kind of thought experiment, I suppose. Um, just thinking about this one individual and his possible journey and entry into Rome. What it absolutely doesn't take account of is the presence of slavery or enslaved labor um, and also formerly enslaved labour. So this is assuming a, a pretty open market for, for labour, whereas, as we all know, the picture is much more complicated than that. Um, so if we look at other inscriptions relating to construction workers, many of those are enslaved or freed. So Maximus um, is actually competing with skilled workers who are embedded within that city. Um, they are tied in, willingly or not, to... Employer, to employers and employment networks already. So he's coming as an, in as an outsider trying to break into that. Um, but one thing I think, as I said at the beginning, we can say is that he was relatively successful. He is skilled and he is wealthy enough to leave this um, commemoration. So I hope what I've done here is, is gone some way towards telling a story about Maximus, if not the story about Maximus, which of course is ultimately um, unknowable. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. That really was fascinating, and it's it's just great to have a, a single example um, brought to our attention like that. Um, now uh, I can have a look. There are three people of. Oh, how on earth does this work? Let's see. Let's let's do this. I mean, I I, I wasn't able to. Uh, uh, fuzzy silhouette of the speaker. Yes. Um, <laughs> How right that is. I'm so sorry, Claire. That's <laughs> fine by me. Um, people saying very enjoyable. Um, okay. Um, are there some questions in the room? Yes. Uh, who's first? Peter. Okay. Uh, just thinking about um, people not knowing in Rome if you have a reputation in Nicomedia. I'm not sure. I think there was a bit probably pessimistic about that because Nicomedia, you know, it has been a royal, royal capital, it was even pro consul, it had a temporary election in an important province. So there, there was no doubt that there was work for it there. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are sort of people suing and calling from capital to Rome all the time. Be all that difficult to get a letter of recommendation from somebody who knows your work to somebody in the world who might be able to give you work. Mm -hmm. I did also <laughs> wonder about him working on particular, sorry, particular projects that would be known, particular buildings that were known in the comedia were known in Rome. Yeah. I'm not sure that uh, people um, online are going to hear the questions from the floor. Am I right? Um, but uh, Professor Wiseman, Pete, uh, was pointing out that uh, Nicomedia is a very, very important city in an important province and that uh, people would almost certainly have connections in Rome and be able to send letters of recommendation. Um, but I mean, it's, it's such an interesting problem that you've raised. Um, now, Andrew, you're going to. Yeah, I, 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 I
Uh, uh, Andrew Burnett. And one was, um, I mean, the first question was about um, the name Calpurnia, um, which cannot be a very common name in Bithynia, um, maybe somebody who's um, migrated there um, uh, from Rome or whatever. Um, and uh, the second question was about, 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 about collegia, yes, whether how you become a member of a collegium and you can't just walk up and and, and uh, claim to be a member, you, you know, mm -hmm. there must be a process. Yeah. yeah, so to take the first one, yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I did wonder about the Calpurnia, that this is somebody who is, um, perhaps his father has come as a migrant and got married in Rome, and then Maximus is, is his son. So I did wonder about the second generation migrant thing. Um, so it's often difficult to tell in these inscriptions, but yeah, with this one, I absolutely take that point. Um, I'm using this really as just a, a kind of thought experiment as somebody who might be um, a migrant. But yes, there is a vetting process for Kalega. You can't just rock up and join in. Um, as I understand it, most of the, the vetting procedure seems to be about your character um, rather than your skill level, but whether implicit within that is your skill level. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you very much. I think it's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to take a brief look and to, to have asked us some very similar important questions. I, I was, in a way, interested in developing a theme that, that, that Peter alluded to there, but in a slightly different way, just thinking about flows of information and also that fascinating tendency sometimes to make generalities uh, in, in antiquity. You know, the best builders come from X, the best this type of soldier comes from Y. Things that are, um, on the one hand, unlikely to be particularly precise, but also can start to form part of an, an assumed knowledge that can be surprisingly enduring. And I was wondering about how that can actually play with certain crafts. You know, we know, for example, the best marble workers might come from XYZ. Um, so I was wondering if you might my comment on that kind of generalizing knowledge uh, mm -hmm. and, and how that might actually factor into a person's prospects when they're writing this new. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, did you want to? Um, yes, it's uh, more succinct than mine. <laughs> no, no, as, as I understand it, uh, Ian was asking about how um, knowledge gets communicated and, and that generalizations tend to develop in antiquity and get established about um, workers, the best workers being from a certain area and so on and how this um, knowledge um, gets transmitted and how it works in a context like this mm -hmm. um that's a really good question thank you it's one i was thinking about particularly with nicomedia that um we do find particularly in the eastern mediterranean um quite a lot of sculptors signing work saying they're from nicomedia now why would you bother to say you're from nicomedia unless potentially that is actually a marker of skill um and i also wonder when it comes to those kind of things, if people are kind of making a tenuous link with Nicomedia, whether they're all true. Um, so I've been looking at this from the point of view of doctors as well, um, how, how genuine are a lot of these links. Um, but I think from the point of view of Nicomedia, that might be um, a reason potentially that Maximus is putting this there, that he's making that link with that area because that might help him out um, when he is looking for work. So yeah, I think that's a really, really good point and a, a real possibility. Thank you. Um, Janet, Janet Delane. Um, I think it's interesting that he says he's from Astrakia, not Nicomedia mm. or Nicomedia, you want to pronounce it. Um, and also that, you know, if you were from Nicomedia, they are mainly um, sculptors and marble workers, which he clearly isn't, mm. he's a different category. So I was just wondering if you've had a look at the alba of um, the Fabri Tinoari in Rome, but also in Austria, where we do actually have something like uh, 300 names, where it's really clear from the Austrian ones, which where we have most, that the majority of them are the Yuli and the Valeri and the sort of general Roman names you would expect. But there are some whose names 
um, there's a, a Corinthianus mm -hmm. and um, somebody who comes you know, that comes from Ptolemaeus. There are there are examples of members of the of the fabric of Maria who do seem to be incomers, as we might call them. And whether that's another way of trying to locate your chap in in that context. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a question about uh, Fabri Tignari and and uh, the question of how outsiders get admitted to this, and that there are sort of traditions of of uh, certain places, um, and that this might explain why uh, so many of them identify themselves by place names. Is this is this the 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 gist of your question, Janet? I think it's more that there are relatively few of ah. the incomers. But they're, and they're the ones we can identify largely by their, their faces. Sorry, yes. thank you. Yes, yes that, that, that. <laughs> there are relatively few incomers, but those that there are are identified by their place names. I haven't looked at them yet, but they are on my list to do because I'm thinking about this more broadly in terms of economic migrants, skilled economic migrants. So it is on my list to do, but I haven't looked at it yet. That's really helpful. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, and and thank you again, Claire. I mean, it's 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 fantastic to see this um, through, uh, as it were, through the eyes of a, a real life person. I mean, it's 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 wonderful to do that, and it was a very illuminating paper. Thank you very thank you. much indeed. Our next speaker is uh, Ian Haynes, uh, professor at the University of Newcastle, professor of archaeology, um, who is well known to. Um, uh, most members of this society for his work on uh, frontiers and um, military communications, but also material culture serving as a way of communicating ideas, um, uh, how, how we can identify the, the movement of ideas through material culture. Now, he's recently been uh, the uh, principal investigator in a project on um, uh, What's it called? Rome, Rome, transformed. Rome transformed. That's right. Which is concentrating on the area of the city of the eastern Celian, the Celian Hill, the Mons Caelius, and it's about that that he's going to talk to us this afternoon. Uh, Ian, right. Well, uh, first of all, many thanks, Fiona. Many thanks, colleagues, for this opportunity to speak uh, about uh, Rome transformed. Uh, Rome transformed is, uh, as Tim has so kindly uh, mentioned in the introduction. Uh, focused on the southeast of Rome, and that uh, musty uh, splodge uh, shows a large part of our area of operations. Um, I'm speaking to you as PI on behalf of a very large and wonderful team, and I think it's so important to note how many people have made this project possible and continue to make it possible. Um, in this picture, there are quite a number I'd like to speak to you about at great length, um, but you may see uh, standing on uh, my left, uh, the excellent Paolo Liberani, who will be known to so many of you. On my uh, right, uh, our fine colleague, uh, Steve Kay from the, the BSR. On the far right, our colleagues from the Socrin, Dentense and Sovereign Dentense, who have done so much to uh, make it possible for us to take work forward. And crucially, the colleagues there on uh, my left, Paolo's left, um, noting Teo Ravasi and Francesca Carboni are fantastic uh, postdoctoral uh, research associates who have done so, so much to make all of this possible. With them there is Dave Heslop, one of our leads in structural analysis on the programme. The point I'd like to emphasise to begin with then is that while I'm going to be talking a lot about spaces and structures, uh, this is very much a project which depends on the efforts of a very large number of uh, researchers and I, it's a great privilege to work with each and every one of them. These glimpses give a sense of the range of work that colleagues are undertaking to build the bigger picture. Rome Transformed began uh, in uh, 2019. It's a five year programme, and uh, you would have noted that COVID uh, has taken place since it started. So that means that some of what I'm going to say is to give you a sense of the range of method and approach, less at this stage on the analysis stages that will follow. So to start off with uh, a couple of comments on what we're aiming to do here. 
in broad terms, we're looking at advancing our understanding of Rome and its place in cultural change across the Mediterranean world. So that, of course, is an extremely ambitious, ambitious aspiration, uh, made more challenging in some ways by the fact that we're trying to look at key themes across eight centuries. Our approach is to actually think about buildings and spaces, contextualizing them in a particular way, presenting new style of visualization, and then to bring this data together to think particularly about political, military, security, and religious uh, change in the southeast of Rome. We have a series of cross-cutting aspects to this project, um, some of them exemplified by the fine work of our attached uh, doctoral uh, students here, uh, Electra, Philida, and Roxana, who are all doing sterling work and that you'll all hear from, uh, I've no doubt, in the years to come. In terms of our parameters, I've introduced the area of our research. It covers some 68 hectares. Within that, there are 21 substantial uh, archaeological structures, uh, excluding the uh, Aurelian Wall and the Claudian Uranian Aqueduct, both of which we are also studying. The aim is to bring uh, a reappraisal of the archaeology for all of these uh, forward uh, in one large project. In terms of topography on the ground, you might think of this area as almost bookmarked by uh, the Lateran Quarter on the west and uh, the area around Santa Croce in Jerusalem, the archaeological park there leading up to Porta Maggiore. We look at this area from uh, Google Earth's perspective. Uh, what you can see, of course, is that while there are some quite large green spaces, which the significance of which will become clearer as we go on, we're also dealing with areas that have a substantial buildup, particularly from the late 19th century onwards. We stop to the south along the line of the Aurelian Wall, and to the north, for those of you who know this quarter, uh, just a little bit beyond the territory of the Villa Volkonsky. Studying the archaeological remains also involves staying acutely sensitive to what lies beneath the modern ground surface. Our aspiration here, therefore, is to think about the city and its archaeology, not just in terms of three dimensions, but also four dimensions. We want to look at the way in which different changes in structure and use of space relate to one another over time. It gives us a chronological spread um, running from the uh, period, the principate of Augustus uh, to the pontificate of Leo III. It therefore involves quite a wide range of specialist interests. And I'm very fortunate the team contains colleagues and members uh, with those areas of expertise and those from several different disciplines. That's at this stage, the slide tells me that I should remove my mask because I might be more audible and I can breathe more clearly. That's better. Right. So moving on, how do the concepts work here? Well, one of the key concepts for us is transformation. And transformation, of course, is an incredibly laden word. Many colleagues will be familiar with the extended discussions about the transformation to late antiquity, for example. But what we're talking about in Rome transform terms are a series of, or a sequence of moments when we can see a marked change in form, nature, or appearance of uh, this part of Southeast Rome. That is something that we want to understand, not just in terms of moments of change, but the way in which subsequent moments <coughs> redefine standing structures and landscapes. And there are, of course, multiple examples of this happening across the city of Rome. I've just taken here the chapel of San Benancio as an example of how this can work in the cityscape that we can see today. Transformations we have sought to address in the long life of this project are peri-urban Rome uh, from the first century CE through to the second uh, century, the Severan transformation of Rome, the big theme, the impact of the construction of the Aurelian Wall in reframing and changing life within the city, the impact during the broad period of Constantine when we see a massive Christianizing of the topography, a series of different challenges when we look at the 5th through to 7th century, and uh, Leonine Rome, when we see a significant uh, development under Leo III of the area, which has implications 
uh, across much of Western Christendom, certainly in the imagination and symbolism of Charlemagne. I'll concentrate here on some of the earlier examples here. And in doing so, I'll talk about the political, military, and religious dimensions that we need to consider. Uh, this is a landscape where we see significant uh, articulations uh, of political uh, ideas uh, through architecture and space. It's an area that has considerable importance for our understanding of the role of the military and security ideas uh, at the heart of empire. And it's a space that ends up playing a formative role in terms of uh, religious cultures, uh, particularly as we go through to late antiquity. And all of these themes clearly intersect in multiple ways. So some general ideas, each of which will have to be uh, followed through and indeed is being followed through uh, in uh, quite granular ways by different colleagues. How do we actually capture the data that allows us to look at some of these problems afresh? The first thing we do is we divide the uh, project area into nine broad zones. Uh, and these zones actually uh, are, are linked in our understanding both to uh, aspects of their particular history uh, in terms of current research and accessibility. Um, uh -huh. But overall, we seek to bring them together into the larger narrative. Working through these areas involves a series of separate tasks, archival analysis, structural analysis, which is essentially a form of standing building uh, archaeology, Geophysical survey, this comprises the largest geophysical survey ever undertaken in Rome to date, and uh, environmental analysis, all of which is actually connected to a programme of physical geographical reappraisal of southeast Rome, literally understanding the changing ground surfaces across our area, and that is tied together by uh, very, uh, we hope, advanced geospatial thinking. So if we look at archival analysis, we acknowledge, of course, that we are standing here on the shoulders of giants as we seek to take things forward. Um, one thinks of the marvelous work of Lanciani, of Corini, um, but also the, the tireless work of the Superintendenza Speciale um, on actually building Archeocita. Now, our aim is to help uh, further develop Archeocita uh, at multiple levels, and our colleagues are working with us uh, tirelessly mm -hmm. on that. So one of the things that we are bringing in, and this works particularly through my excellent colleague Francesca Carboni, uh, is a reappraisal of the full array of archival uh, resources uh, that apply to this area. Seven major archives have information, uh, and the two that we're most uh, busy with at the moment are outlined here. Bringing in archives, of course, involves not just the archives of recent excavations, of which there are many, uh, but also those going back through ownership and ownership of this area and incorporating historical cartography, uh, site documentation and historical photography. Being able to layer a lot of this information again on the contemporary landscape of Rome and link it to archaeological data is something that we can do because of the extensive survey work that we have done and built on uh, with our friends from Archeocita. Into that goes the structural analysis too. And this uh, literally is a site by site, uh, very precise reworking of a whole range of exposed excavations. Um, and it allows us to actually apply a shared methodology over 21 uh, different uh, individual sites and across the Aurelian Wall uh, and the Claudia Neuronian Aqueduct, allowing much more comparison than was previously possible phase by phase. So the Mark I eyeball uh, is a vital tool here, but in order to ensure that we can actually have a, a, a very precise uh, array of uh, survey data to work from, uh, we model all of these structures uh, in detail in three dimensions. And this includes some of the biggest in Rome. Here you can see the team starting on the uh, Claudio Neuronian aqueduct as it passes through the grounds of Villa Bolkonski. Recording that uh, aqueduct includes the uh, use of extensive terrestrial laser scanning to record all that stands there. When it gets to the really high bits, 
uh, we use uh, UAVs, drones, a structure from motion photography to generate detailed models that we can cross interrogate alongside the work that we're doing actually on the ground to gain the most precise interpretations we can. Those are the areas that either above or below ground are accessible to structural analysis. Of course, many of these areas are not. So that takes us to the challenge of geophysical uh, survey. Um, applying geophysical survey uh, to an area uh, where we have such uh, complexity uh, presents an array of challenges neatly summarized here by, by Steve Kay of the BSR, one of our key team members. And it has to be said that elements of our geophysical survey involve the experimental, pushing some of these systems to their absolute uh, limits. Worth keeping in mind that in some areas, the ground surface during our period of study has jumped by over 10 meters. This presents real challenges, obviously, to understanding some of the deeper elements. Here you can see our outline program uh, for the, uh, the geophysics, where our geophysics goes, and you will note that it includes a number of areas of roads in Rome too. We therefore have ended up annoying pedestrians and drivers alike on multiple occasions while working in Rome and um, having scratched our heads for a while on what could possibly uh, empty the streets of Rome for any time had not uh, assumed that COVID might in some small ways be a positive factor for some of our researchers. Um, what you can see are an array of different uh, ground penetrating radar systems used. Sometimes we use these different antennae to overlap with one another to actually see how they work in terms of different uh, ground uh, conditions to enhance our understanding. And we work routinely, of course, through the study of multiple time slices, a classic uh, way of approaching GPR data. Uh, this one just in from a couple of weeks ago, produced by the BSR team working within Rome Transformed, uh, demonstrates if you look in the bottom right quartile, uh, the presence of a structure, possible tower foundation on the Aurelian wall that was not previously known. A key feature in covering such large areas is vehicle-borne uh, GPR. And here we're working with our partners uh, within Rome Transform, Geo Studi Astia. And traveling through the roads of Rome involves us in a particularly perilous quest that is to say, blocking off public parking periodically. And uh, that was one of the most hair-raising moments, actually, when I stood watching these signs being put up and waited to be attacked by an angry mob. I'd have every sympathy with them. But fortunately, our colleagues handled this with aplomb, and we were able, during the night, in these empty parking spots to actually access uh, these areas with GPR, increasing our footage still further. What does that data look like as we're trying to interpret it? This is a case where, as I said earlier on, we're pushing various different and experimental systems forward, in this case using uh, IQ Maps uh, software, uh, to look at the product of vehicle-based radar in areas that have not previously been uh, examined by uh, GPR. You can see that's been set against that hardy uh, perennial uh, Google Earth, uh, in order to give you a sense of the location there immediately north of the Lateran area. Other systems that we use include electrical resistance tomography, which gives us a different pattern and depth. And that is set alongside a program of borehole survey. So the aim here at each stage to get a deeper interlinked sense of what lies beneath ground. That is in turn linked to a large program of environmental reconstruction. Um, and that involves a, a different array of approaches to uh, the extraction of cores uh, from the area, uh, which are taking us, I hope, forward into a, a more profound understanding of what these transformations mean in a landscape setting. What does it mean? Uh, for example, when we see a transformation from the Horti to an increased military presence? What does it mean when we see the transformation uh, wrought by the Aurelian Wall? Lots of data then, but gathering data, hard though it is, is obviously just a part of this. How do we then seek to integrate our data and make 
the results that we are developing uh, transparent. Uh, well, we have a number of different approaches uh, to this. Uh, one thing that is very important is the development of a 3D uh, GIS. Uh, we call it uh, RT3D uh, uh, that allows individuals to move through uh, the different spaces and structures for this entire complex over time. Uh, but another approach that we use at the site specific level is what I call three tier visualization. Three tier visualization is the integration of some of those systems that you've seen. Uh, total um, TLS, uh, terrestrial laser scanning here, uh, shown alongside uh, GPR results and scanning from subterranean spaces, allowing us to actually connect together different elements of buildings, those that we can see, those that we can't see, into a deeper understanding of how complexes made, were made and uh, stand in the changing landscape of the city. Once we've got this data, we try and reappraise how individual structures would have looked uh, when they were first created. And we do this through the development of our own 3D models. Uh, bringing in a range of different specialists to bait in a process that I call, we now call provocation. Uh, the modeling of uh, reconstructions of structures, uh, as they're often uh, mistakenly termed, uh, can be very confusing. People present photorealistic images of past structures based on only very partial knowledge. Uh, the need to make transparent how people actually reached the deductions about buildings is important, but the process of doing this is also a great aid to good intellectual exchange between specialists of uh, different uh, uh, areas of scholarship. So provocation um, is something that my uh, friend and colleague Taylor Abassi uh, recently spoke very eloquent, uh, eloquently on because the area in which she's been uh, playing a key uh, leading role recently uh, the area of the Ospedale di San Giovanni is one of those where we've trialled our provocation system. Now, in this area, to the north of the Lateran Basilica, uh, we have, amongst other elements, a late antique domus uh, excavated in the 1970s and then rather eccentrically recorded um, by um, Santa Maria uh, Scrinari. Uh, we've reinterpreted that and in the process have actually uh, undertaken a provocation phase to try and help uh, explain what the archaeological remains uh, would have looked like. Um, now, the provocation is supported by a series of justifications, but also by a series of alternative models in order to expose the degree to which our knowledge of these sites and structures is perhaps uncertain. And this is something that we're doing through the instrument of what we call CDOC, as you see here, a web-based system that allows us to have an open and transparent discussion online with colleagues. Now, finally, bringing all of these things together, building by building, exposed through CDOC, observing the larger scale transformations, brings us back to another form of modeling that lies at the heart of the project. The Lateran area itself has been our test bed for this. Uh, here again, you've seen some of the work that we've done using different methods. The multi-phase transformation of this landscape is a particularly striking example of what we're addressing. In this area, deep beneath the modern cathedral, uh, you can see traces not only of uh, very luxurious, one might say palatial uh, dwellings that occupied this area through into the first century, then uh, destroyed and essentially built into uh, or built over rather by the foundations of the Castronova, the uh, camp of uh, the Imperial Horse Guard. That area again was subsequently to be uh, reused as the place for Constantine's first cathedral. Now our provocations uh, allow us uh, to actually take the data that we've got from extensive survey, from all those structural analysis, from the geophysical work, from the archival work, to present provocations such as this one of the Castronova as it might have appeared around about the year 200, and then to give a sense of what 
not merely a sense, but we hope a geospatially accurate sense of how that landscape transformation works when, for example, in this area, Constantine builds his first cathedral, the world's first cathedral, actually on the same site, destroying the Castronova and marking a marked transformation in landscape use from the military use of this area in the Severan period uh, through to the Christianized topography uh, of Southeast Rome under Constantine. <laughs> Alongside the images that we've seen, the concept models that give a sense of space, also vital is to understand the environment from the point of view of decoration, art, visual, aesthetic transformation too. Fortunately, in these areas, the evidence is rich enough to sustain that as well. This example taken from one of the rooms at the heart of that building. So we can then see something of the drama of the transformation when we see the basilica subsequently uh, in, constructed on top of the site and uh, shortly thereafter uh, the baptistry that augments it and understand better how they are relating to a transformation of topography and a transformation of the city. So I've probably spoken for rather too long, but I hope I've given you a, a sense of how we're trying to bring together the various different strands. And in giving you a sense of the various different strands, flagging up the fact that we are at an early stage in this project, uh, nonetheless, uh, just completing our data capture for the entire area, which has been delayed by COVID. Uh, but thanks to the resilience and talent of uh, the team uh, that I'm fortunate to work with, uh, many of whom, but not all of whom are shown in this picture, but we've been able to keep ploughing on and I hope we'll have some more exciting results for you uh, in the coming years. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk today. Fantastic, Ian, really. <laughs> um, Rome transformed, absolutely. Okay. Um, I thought that was wonderful. Uh, um, can I um, start? I, I mean, I don't see any evidence of any anybody using the chat, so we'll um, throw this open to questions here. But could I start by uh, just asking why you chose this region, or was it chosen for you? Uh, how, how did why this particular area? I mean, thank you. Um, I have the privilege uh, of working uh, underneath the Lateran for about well, not not every day for 10 years, but, but over the over 10 years before uh, we launched Rome Transformed. Um, so I started out there and some of the key themes uh, for me in transformation uh, seemed to come through very, very strongly. I felt that there was an important specific story about the Southeast of Rome, but that that story also had something uh, very significant to tell us about a wider story of the transformation mm. of classical Rome to, uh, to, to, to uh, Christian Rome. Um, so working there with my my excellent uh, friend Paolo Liberani was was a joy uh, an education, and uh, it meant that we were constantly asking questions about other areas, and were then very privileged in turn uh, to find that uh, some other scholars who were already engaged in work, and I think particularly the fantastic team working at Santa Croce, were very happy to collaborate with us as part of a larger program with an integrated methodology. That was really why the southeast sort mm. of drew me. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, is it a, a understudied area? Do you think? I mean, in general, I mean, by comparison with the parts of the city. Um, I'm always reminded of that ac academic propensity to say that whatever one's doing is strangely <laughs> overlooked. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> uh, I think that on the one hand, uh, of course, uh, there have been some remarkable studies uh, conducted, uh, but they've often been on individual buildings uh, or complexes. Um, to take the area together uh, is, I mean, there's some superb papers addressing key topographic themes, but to take the whole area together with the advantages that recent developments in archaeological practice give and will hopefully give in the future, uh, that, that I think is a new departure, yeah. Right. Right. Yes, um, Philip. Are there any other similar projects going on that you're aware of around Rome? I mean, I know there's been one recently beside the Tiber for a ball hole to be in the same. But mm. are you aware of any, anything else that's going on that's similar to your project? Because obviously technology is developing. Yeah. Yes. 
uh, are, are oh, there please, any please. other uh, projects of the same kind going on in other areas of the city? Um, there are, you can see elements of many of these approaches elsewhere. Um, for example, uh, to just take one example, uh, Portus uh, did very interesting work integrating ERT uh, with borehole survey. Um, the uh, fantastic teams from the BSR, CNR, uh, and uh, Geostudi Astia uh, all have done bits of work in Rome before, and we're all learning from one another. I think the, the thing that we're doing that is, I would argue, rather different, is we are seeking to exploit to the full uh, that there are 11 to 12 areas where we still have historic excavations that are open, sometimes very deep, that we're able to therefore uh, undertake structural analysis in those areas and then link them into that wider body of geophysical data, borehole data, archival data. Um, and that is the, the linchpin really of trying to argue that we can advance uh, a 4D approach to an area with sometimes very deep archaeology indeed. Yes, Peter. I'm just wondering, what will count as a successful outcome? Not the hope that Rome is transformed because the first century BC is under the Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Yes. 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 Clearly, you're going to get an immense amount of data. Yeah. But what question? Yes. Or questions? Thank you. Advanced? Oh, yes, you've got to summarize um, this. Sorry. Yes. 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 Well, basically, what will count as a successful outcome? Right. There are several ways that I'm counting successful outcomes, and I'm able already, I'm glad to say, to chalk some of them up. But I think that this, um, so let, let's start off with the reappraisal of each of these complexes is already proving a transformation for us. Uh, I could cite a number of examples. The reappraisal of the work that Pelliccioni did under the Lateran uh, baptistry, uh, we've demonstrated the phasing of that is fundamentally flawed. Uh, the plans of uh, the structures around the uh, Horti of Domitio Lucilla, uh, as uh, studied uh, by Santa Maria Scrinari, all of the published plans actually show that there are fundamental errors in orientation and alignment. Uh, those have been amended. Um, in other areas, the, the phasing and the decoration of key structures sometimes has not been uh, identified before. So for example, just this September, in work that I didn't uh, actually discuss uh, here, work on the amphitheater from Castrense, we were able to find previously unidentified traces of the original color and decoration of the amphitheater. So that's at the structural level. Um, the um, methodological level itself is quite important. We are seeing that we can actually link certain forms of geophysics to structural analysis in new ways. We're also seeing what does and doesn't work. So that has all sorts of implications for scholars who are coming after us. Um, then uh, moving on from that, when we have populated, we're looking at future goals and aspirations. When we've been able to populate our, 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 our new uh, RT3D or 3D GIS. We have uh, an array of uh, spaces and uh, routes of communication that allow us to rethink how this area is being used, how people are moving through it, how movement is actually operating. And that is not particularly well understood. So if we consider, for example, uh, those two, uh, I summarise them rather crudely as bookmarks, the, uh, the Lateran to the west and Santa Croce to, to the east. We consider what's going on in the space between those two actually has very significant implications for how we read that area of Rome and its subsequent evolution. Um, multiple different hypotheses about it, but all of them merely hypotheses because we haven't got data to be able to explore that. So I think that being able to refine answers in terms of the way that these uh, relationships between these structures work is very important. Um, and also to be able to understand how those relationships work over time. Uh, the implications 
of the Severan, to take one example, transformation of Rome for the later development of the area, I think is still underestimated, and yet it was crucially formative. So I hope that has given you my sense, at least, of what I think is successful. In other words, there are different audiences. There are some who get quite excited about the geophysics implications, some who want to know more about the structural archaeology. Bigger questions about Rome. And finally, there's one other point. This project is not just about this project team. At the end of the day, this data is going to be freely available, and it's going to be of a calibre that is going to allow researchers we don't even, in some cases, I wouldn't advise them of this, don't necessarily even need to visit Rome to actually have mm -hmm. detailed access to data that they can recut and interpret differently. So it's, a, it's, I hope we're changing the level of quality data available as well. That's a success for me too. Fantastic. Um, well, I can just uh, reiterate the point that was made um, by, um, uh, somebody who used the chat uh, thing and uh, uh, Victoria Cullen who just said what a wonderful paper this was. Um, it was an eye-opener and, and thank you very much. I mean we've really uh, I think been treated to something quite special this evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.